If you have spent any time online, especially on platforms such as Tumblr and TikTok, you may have, like myself, noticed a trend um, of young girls online embracing the female rage characters. Or if you're not chronically online, you may be asking yourself, what on earth is a female rage character? Female rage characters are women in film, television, and other media who exhibit characteristics or emotions that may be more rare to see from female characters on screen, such as violence, anger, and rage. Common female rage characters you'll see the girls worshipping online are Pearl from Pearl, Lisa from Girl Interrupted, Nina from Black Swan, Amy Dune from Gone Girl, Jennifer from Jennifer's Body, Tomi from the Tomi Manga series, amongst others. Though this online phenomenon of female rage is surprisingly not exclusive to female characters, as discussed in my previous essay, Why Women Love American Psycho, Patrick Bateman has also been claimed by the female rage femme cells of the internet. In addition, many real-life women can also be attributed to the female rage phenomenon online. Whilst scrolling the female rage tag on Tumblr, you would be apt to find photos of Fiona Apple, Mitski, and Ethel Kane alongside Sylvia Plath excerpts. The obsession with female rage stems from a woman's programming to perform for the male gaze. Since the day women are born, we are taught and programmed to behave in ways that are the most appealing to men, to be delicate, sweet, soft, and kind. As the medium of cinema has been largely a field dominated by men, we have throughout history almost exclusively watched women being portrayed through the perspective of the male gaze. And therefore, we have internalized this way of seeing women. And as women, we have internalized this way of seeing ourselves. It has been suggested that women operate with an internalized man inside of our heads, judging our every move. And therefore, we perform for him. When we are alone in our rooms, sprawled out on our bed, we fix our posture to lay more seductively. For whom? The man inside our head. As Margaret Atwood wrote in The Robber Bride, male fantasies, male fantasies, is everything run by male fantasies. Up on a pedestal or down on your knees, it's all a male fantasy. That you're strong enough to take what they dish out or else too weak to do anything about it. Even pretending you aren't catering to male fantasies is a male fantasy. Pretending you're unseen, pretending you have a life of your own, that you can wash your feet and comb your hair unconscious of the ever-present watcher peering through the keyhole, peering through the keyhole in your own head, if nowhere else. You are a woman with a man inside watching a woman. You are your own voyeur. Because in many ways, we are products of what we consume. The information, images, and sounds we experience and consume become a part of our programming and subconscious thought. And as a woman, the overwhelming majority of the content that we consume is through the perspective of the voyeuristic gaze of men. And thus, we have become trained to view ourselves in the same way a man would, both consciously and unconsciously. We see ourselves through the third-person view because this is how we have been taught to perceive our existence as women. To quote John Berger in The Ways of Seeing, To be born a woman has been to be born within an allotted and confined space into the keeping of men. But this has been at the cost of a woman's self being split into two. A woman must continually watch herself. She is almost continually accompanied by her own image of herself. While she is walking across a room, or while she is weeping at the death of her father, she can scarcely avoid envisioning herself walking or weeping. From earliest childhood, she has been taught and persuaded to survey herself continually, and so she comes to consider the surveyor and the surveyed within herself as the two consistent yet always distinct elements of her identity as a woman. She has to survey everything she is and everything she does because how she appears to others and ultimately how she appears to men is of crucial importance for what is normally thought of as the success of her life. 
Her own sense of being in herself is supplemented by a sense of being appreciated as herself by another. One might simplify this by saying, men act and women appear. Men look at women, women watch themselves being looked at. This determined not only most relationships between men and women, but also the relation of women to themselves. The surveyor of women in herself is male. The surveyed is female. Thus, she turns herself into an object, and most particularly, an object of vision, a sight. As John Berger explores, it is not only the medium of cinema that has been largely, near exclusively, dominated by the male gaze, but most mediums of art throughout history. John Berger, in The Ways of Seeing, primarily relates the idea of the male gaze and the internalized male gaze back to paintings and photographs, and the ways in which the male gaze in paintings has set the precedent for the male gaze in advertisements, though this representation of women through the male gaze and thus the representation of their emotions through the male gaze and their fear of female anger is far from modern and is evident within folklore and female archetypes as well. American novelist Leslie Jameson states in I Used to Insist I Didn't Get Angry, Not Anymore, the phenomenon of female anger has often been turned against itself. The figure of the angry woman reframed as a threat. She conjures a lineage of threatening archetypes. The harpy and her talons, the witch and her spells, the medusa and her writhing locks. The notion that female anger is unnatural or destructive is learned young. Children report perceiving displays of anger as more acceptable from boys than from girls. Because films have largely been written by men for men, female archetypes can fall into a trap of leaning heavily on gender roles. They sulk beautifully in their bedroom instead of raising their voice. They bite their tongue as a tear falls gently down their face. Which isn't to say that the idea of or the depiction of angry women is an entirely new concept, but as we see a rise in the prominence of women's voices in film, we also see a rise in the prominence of female anger and rage. And when we do, it can be utterly jarring to watch, or alternatively, comforting. As feminist film critic Laura Mulvey suggests in her essay, Visual Pleasure and Narrative Cinema, the sexual politics of looking suggests inherent objectification and caters to masculine scopophilia, or the sexual pleasure derived from looking. Visual media is inherently voyeuristic, sexualizing women to appease male voyeuristic pleasure. Female characters become subhuman in a way framed entirely by their relation to and pursuit of male desire. To be completely genuine, though written by a man, Maddie from Euphoria has been a character of complete and utter solace for me. Many women struggle to even access their anger and may instead cry from frustration. And although I certainly have shed my fair share of tears, I am someone who has always had a very easy access to anger and rage. Maddie is a character that I felt immediately like I related to when I watched Euphoria due to the depiction of her anger and her access to rage. Like Maddie, in situations where other girls would cry, I would be apt to lash out. This access to anger is something that is seen as masculine, and my access to anger is something that I have always felt embarrassed by. I always wanted to be feminine to never raise my voice as one dainty tear falls elegantly down my cheek. I wanted to be seen as soft and sweet, but at times my anger would prohibit me from being perceived as such. I felt frustrated by this. I was jealous of my friends who claimed they never felt anger. I somehow felt that by raising my voice, I was less of a woman. To quote Leslie Jameson again, According to a review of studies of gender and anger written in 2000 by Anne M. Kring, men and women self-report anger episodes with comparable degrees of frequency, but women report experiencing more shame and embarrassment in their aftermath. People are more likely to use the words bitchy and hostile to describe female anger, while male anger is more likely to be described as strong. 
Kring reported that men are more likely to express their anger by physically assaulting objects or verbally attacking other people, while women are more likely to cry when they get angry, as if their bodies are forcibly returning them to the appearance of the emotion, sadness, with which they are most commonly associated. When I was a child, sometimes I would argue with my friends about something silly where my friend would cry and I wouldn't. Not because I wasn't hurt, but because that isn't how my hurt manifested. And because I wasn't crying, I was blamed. I was the villain rather than the victim. I was the antagonist because I wasn't crying. Similarly, the women in these female rage films are not victims. Or at least not in the traditional sense. These women are often depicted as victims of a larger societal issue and enact revenge on their oppressor, who is usually a man. Rather than being the damsel in distress, these women are willing to get their hands dirty and be their own savior, but at the cost of becoming the villain, or at least being perceived as one. Take Jennifer's body, for example. Jennifer's body is entirely about the suppression of emotions that are deemed unacceptable for women, and the explosion of rage when Jennifer feels she is allowed to express it. Jennifer's transformation into a monstrous is about her finally having a vessel to express her rage and enact revenge. In her newfound succubus form, she enacts revenge on men who desire her for her body, because she is no longer a girl with a man inside her head. She is a demon in the shell of a girl, and therefore free of conditioned restraints. She objectifies men in the way that they have objectified her. She treats them like nothing but a body, like meat as she consumes them. This is proven when Needy says to Jennifer, you're killing people, to which Jennifer responds, no, I'm killing boys thus emphasizing the way in which she dehumanizes men specifically, the way men have dehumanized her. Jennifer's transition into a monstrous has less to do with transformation and more to do with the fact that her new monstrous persona allows her a vessel to express her suppressed rage. Because when you are a beautiful woman, you are expected to accept and even embrace and be thankful for the male attention that you receive. You are expected to smile and be nice even when the interaction leads to your discomfort, or in Jennifer's case, her murder. We as the audience bear witness to Jennifer Check as her new demonic body gives her permission to finally unleash the stagnant rage inside of her as a result of being objectified, sexualized, and ultimately murdered by men. Florence Welch said this in regards to her song Dream Girl Evil. I think there's something about being a young woman that feels very murderous. That's what I was trying to get with a song like Dream Girl Evil. It can be dangerous for people to think that you're incredibly nice. When you get you're an angel, that seems like such a high place to fall from. When I see messy or violent or terribly behaved women, especially young women, there's a liberation to not have to try and survive by being good. It is that feminine pressure I mentioned, to be dainty and quiet, to not take up too much space, to be angelic, good, and perfect. In an interview at Cannes Film Festival, Charlize Theron was asked how she accessed and channeled enough rage for her character Furiosa in Mad Max. Theron replied, uh, surprise, women have that. I'm not the only one. The author of Gone Girl, Gillian Flynn, explores her relationship with female anger in her essay, I Was Not a Nice Little Girl. Flynn states, I think women like to read about murderous mothers and lost little girls because it's our mainstream outlet to even begin discussing female violence on a personal level. Female violence is a specific brand of curiosity. It's invasive. A girl fight is all teeth, hair, spit, and nails, a much more fearsome thing to watch than two dudes clobbering each other. And the mental violence is positively gory. Women entwine. Some of the most disturbing, sick relationships are between longtime friends, and especially mothers and daughters. Innuendo, backspin, false encouragement, punishing withdrawal, sexual jealousy, garden variety jealousy. 
Watching women go to work on each other is a horrific bit of pageantry that can stretch on for years. Libraries are filled with stories on generations of brutal men trapped in cycles of aggression. I want to write stories about the violence of women. I particularly mourn the lack of female villains, good, potent female villains. I'm talking violent, wicked women, scary women. Don't tell me you don't know some. The point is, women have spent so many years girl-powering ourselves to the point of almost parodic encouragement. We've left no room to acknowledge our dark side. Dark sides are important. They should be nurtured, like nasty black orchids. Gillian Flynn famously explores the confines of performative feminine perfection in her novel Gone Girl. Her protagonist, Amy Dune, is a woman who is completely and utterly driven by the expectation to be perfect. The character Amy Dune expresses this in the book. I grew up feeling special, proud. I was the girl who battled oblivion and won. The chances were about 1%, but I did it. I ruined my mother's womb in the process, my own personal Sherman's March. Mary Beth would never have another baby. As a child, I got vibrant pleasure out of this. Just me, just me, only me. I've always been better than the hopes. I was the one who made it. But I've been jealous too, always. Seven dead dancing princesses. They got to be perfect without even trying, without even facing one moment of existence. While I am stuck here on earth and every day I must try and every day is a chance to be less than perfect. Amy Dune is representative of the obsession behind the pursuit of perfection, especially amongst women and girls. Amy beat all odds and survived her mother's pregnancy in spite of her mother's several miscarriages. Though due to being the baby who finally made it, there is a lot of pressure put on Amy since the day she was born to match her parents' expectations of her. Amy Dune was cursed with gifted child syndrome from the moment she took her first breath. Though perfection is a narrow and suffocating place. In her striving for perfection, Amy doesn't care what or who she destroys in her path. For Amy, perfection has always been synonymous with survival. The destruction of her mother's womb symbolizes the first home she's willing to destroy for her own survival, foreshadowing the lengths she goes to to ensure her survival above Nick's. Though her mother's seven unborn children haunt Amy, because they do not need to perform perfection in order to be loved. They are loved unconditionally as is, and Amy can never live up to this perfection because humans are inherently flawed and will ultimately make mistakes and disappoint others eventually. Dune's calculated intellect, remorseless aggression, and competitive nature are qualities we typically see reserved for male protagonists. In her essay, Beneath the Cool Girl Exterior, Why Female Rage Films Are All the Rage, Kimberly John Bautista states, When women get written with anger powerful enough to move the story, they are almost immediately villainized in the public eye. They imply that rage is an irrational emotion. This be crazy, right? Well, crazy calls into question an angry woman's capability to make sound judgments and thus effectively silencing her. It's the easiest way to end an argument and excuse the offender from taking responsibility for their actions. That section of Amy's iconic monologue underlines how anger is often seen as unbecoming of a good woman. It also highlights how people have come to associate conformity with desirability the reality is women have just been conditioned to respond to suffering with sorrow and misery. We are expected to hold our pain quietly and gratuitously perform the role we have been assigned since birth, the damsel in distress, with beady eyes and a lone teardrop rolling down our cheeks, begging to be rescued. And if we don't wear our victimhood like a badge, our grievances are doubted, challenged, or dismissed altogether. As Amy exposes the cool girl phenomenon, she reveals that women are required and expected to wear a series of masks. 
At the end of the novel, Amy reiterates that becoming a wife is a strange thing because it requires a woman to mask her true self, something she is no longer willing to do. She decides she will no longer suppress her rage and anger. Whereas other portrayals of unhinged women have concluded in the woman being silenced, often through her death, it is Nick rather than Amy who is silenced in the end. The strive for perfection driving one to snap can also be seen prevalent, prevalently in Natalie Portman's Nina in Black Swan. The obsessed artist takes form as Nina is driven to insanity through her pursuit of perfection as a ballerina. One could see the art of ballet as an allegory for the female experience itself. From the outside looking in, the art of ballet is delicate, beautiful, and dainty, the ultimate feminine art form. Though closer examination will reveal the pain underneath, the skipped dinners and bloodied feet, the endless rehearsals and tears, the ever-present haunting fear of not being good enough, of being anything short of perfect. Also that the ballerina, in spite of her cracked toenails, can maintain the illusion of effortlessness as she elegantly glides across the stage with a smile on her face. Like ballet, womanhood is bleeding in isolation, skipped meals, and the masking of one's pain behind a smile, all in pursuit of idealized perfection. One must not disrupt the spectacle. The voyeuristic gaze of the audience must be satisfied. To be perceived as a woman is to perform. However vast her narcissism, the young girl doesn't love herself. What she loves is her image. This is something that is not only foreign and exterior to her, but that possesses her in the full sense of the word. The young girl lives under the tyranny of this ungrateful master. In her essay, Blood and Wine, Unbridled Female Rage in Horror Films, Lee Nassar states, in recent years, we have been able to witness a near renaissance in the role of woman on screen, and in few genres more so than horror. While earlier films utilized female sexuality and being in their victims' deaths or trauma in the case of The Final Girl, more modern horror and thriller films have begun seeing female characters in a much different role, that of the villain. From bloodied prom night in Carrie to Dakota Johnson's witch dancer mother of all hell portrayal of Susie in Suspiria, there has been an emergence of female rage and anger being portrayed on film in a very new way. Women being wronged, abused, and hurt only to come out with a hidden card and unleash their building carnage without a care, and often onto the male characters within the work. Like their male counterparts, this villainy comes with a variety of methods and reasons, from giving up one's soul to the devil to simply being bored. Even their very villainy comes about in multidimensional ways, but often with severe dwellings underneath their poise and violence. Part of the appeal of this rage is that it is something so seldom depicted on screen. Women are expected to be dainty, quiet, and feminine, if shaving commercials and romantic comedies have taught us anything. So to see them thrashing about, overtaken by physical demons or pure anger, often covered in blood or in the process of being so, to witness their hands doing the killing rather than being at the killer's hands, and to see little to no remorse for it, Many women have found solace in these characters of women unbashably angry and committing acts of unspeakable rage. While society has become used to seeing women as the victims of monstrous acts on screen, it's still a very new thing to see women as the perpetrators. It sends a clear message. You don't know what we're capable of. It's addicting. As always, when women, especially young women, find joy in anything, it must be boiled down to superficiality. Because of course, girls are incapable of meaningful thought. As the trend of female rage has followed suit, 
the unhinged woman genre has been boiled down to merely synonymous with girl boss without taking the time to consider how important the portrayal of female rage is in media. In many ways, the unhinged woman has been repackaged and sold to us with the image of a young, hot white girl covered in blood and holding a knife. And for that reason, it is also important to recognize the intersections of identity when addressing female rage. As even the more progressive and modern reclamation of female rage is often represented to us in the body of a pretty white girl. Anger in non-white women, specifically black women, has been stifled and ridiculed repeatedly in, attempt, in an attempt to silence black women and femmes for the comfort of white audiences. This ridicule becomes evident when one observes the stereotype of the angry black woman or the sassy black woman in media. And the way in which this anger has been trivialized for a more palatable consumption by the white gaze. And the silencing becomes further frustrating when one acknowledges that throughout history and presently, white women have weaponized their sadness and tears and their perception as a fragile white woman to their advantage against black women in an attempt to silence black women. To then shed this image of fragility and market the face of female rage as a conventionally attractive white woman is unjust. Audre Lorde stated in her 1981 speech, The Uses of Anger, Women Responding to Racism. Women of color in America have grown up within a symphony of anger, at being silenced, at being unchosen, at knowing that when we survive, it is in spite of a world that takes for granted our lack of humanness and which hates our very existence outside of its service. It is not the anger of other women that will destroy us, but our refusal to stand still, to listen to its rhythms, to learn within it, to move beyond the manner of presentation to, to the substance, to tap that anger as an important source of empowerment. In addition to the trivialization of black anger, another important reason to recognize as to why black women are not being represented in the media of female rage and unhinged women is that although women's voices are being slowly more emphasized in film and television, in the already very small pool of women whose voices are being elevated as writers, producers, and directors, it is almost exclusively the voices of white women that are receiving funding on their projects and being uplifted by studios, which is a huge problem for a variety of reasons, but as we can see, it has influenced the way in which we perceive female rage. It forms confines around who we perceive it okay to express anger and who we do not. To quote Leslie Jameson once again, if an angry woman makes people uneasy, then her more palatable counterpart, the sad woman, summon summons sympathy more readily. She often looks beautiful in her suffering, ennobled, transfigured, elegant. Angry women are messier. Their pain threatens to cause more collateral damage. It's as if the prospect of a woman's anger harming other people threatens to rob her of the social capital she has gained by being wrong. We are most comfortable with female anger when it promises to regulate itself, to refrain from recklessness, to stay civilized. Women have found solace in the portrayal of female rage through the vessel of the unhinged woman because we feel seen. After a lifetime of performing for a gaze that may not even be there, you are seen. Not for the isolated performance for the man inside your head, but for the woman that you are at your core as if you are suddenly granted permission to be ugly. You are allowed to scream and cry and be dirty and bloody. You are allowed to be a mess. You are allowed to be imperfect. You are allowed to be human. You are allowed to free yourself from the confines of performative femininity and feel your feelings, to express your feelings. Women are taught to swallow their anger to suppress and substitute this sensation with words such as disappointment or frustrated, perpetually shrinking themselves smaller, even subconsciously. No longer confined to the expectations of feminine performance, bearing witness to the unhinged woman in cinema is being permission to exhale after a lifetime of holding our breath.
Every woman has a well-stocked arsenal of anger, potentially useful against these oppressions, personal and institutional, which brought that anger into being. Focused with precision, it can become a powerful source of energy serving progress and change. And when I speak of change, I do not mean a simple switch of positions or a temporary lessening of tensions, nor the ability to smile or feel good. I am speaking of basic and radical alteration in those assumptions underlining our lives.